Thursday, last Thursday, I got kind of comfortable uh, in terms of trying to set up some of the ideas that, that I had actually been trying to set up, but didn't quite get around to. Um, and in particular, I guess, I guess John is sort of uh, something an idea that I hadn't really noticed, which again seems rather helpful, which is that well, so I, I've been trying to talk about general ideas about different methods of categorization and decategorization. And John, for the last time, spoke about one particular method of decategorization. And uh, it's kind of, first of all, it's, it's, it's very important and very simple, and uh, it's something I kind of overlooked. And it goes, I guess it goes like this. It goes from group voice To yes. Where is the finite Finite Not necessarily. I guess I guess it will be partially defined for that. Partially defined. Uh, yeah, you can think of those from I need to mark the class of good boys or something and it's being partially defined. And um, I'll say it's going to the real numbers. I haven't got to think about that for I thought it might be rational numbers. Uh, so this is what I was trying to do. Oh, is it a Z? Well, first of all, I think it's as many as I want. Okay. <laughs> I, the question is maybe making it too small. Um, and I guess I'm being cautious by making it reasonably big. I want to tell you, I want to include the positive Rio. I guess, yeah, the question comes up, will I ever want to include any negative reals? Or will I ever want to include any complex numbers? I may, I might want to include, well, I guess how do we figure out how to talk about finite groups that give negative cardinality? We don't want to talk about okay. group ways to give negative cardinality. Because if we've always avoided that the issue of negative with finite groups, so, you know. Yeah, um, let's see, I guess, I mean, I'll but there may be some infinite groups to want to have a negative? It all depends how far now thinky you get about summing divergent series, right? So, yeah. so far you could write, I made up the concept of pain group voice, which is one where the group voice cardinality converges. So if you're a pain group voice up there, there you go into the positive, non negative real number. And that would be. Pain, pain group voice numbers? Yeah. But then um, if you want to start. Going beyond that, you can get some some to diverge as your cardinality. And then Euler and others invented all sorts of bizarro tricks for coming up with some of those. But in particular, negative, for, for example. In particular, there are some in the very sneaky ways one has negative numbers. Oh. Sorry? There are some group boys that in some rather sneaky ways seem to want to have uh, negative numbers. Yeah. We haven't really talked about all the extensions of the basic idea yet. Well, okay. Then maybe I should use the pain report. Yeah, okay. For now, let's use it as pain report. So, this is the concept that's cooked up, so it's basically a little bit. Uh, a totally defined map. Um, so I, 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 I guess you could have a semi chain where you include positive spin here, but we don't even want to do that, right? We don't even want to have. Mm, um, you could, but. Okay, let's, right. So we'll, we'll say chain would actually have to have a real number. In fact, in this case, it might be that we'll just take the positive one. Um, I was going to be positive. Yeah, yeah. Um, like the group of the time. That's called P. They can be like the book R. Okay. Oh, I'm going to have that. So this is the positive real. 
And um, and John defines John defines this, this concept. And it's a D group, it's a decategorification process. This is a decategorification process. Uh, and I guess I guess we should write down the formula again. So what's the formula? The formula is group point G goes to sum over how do you do sum over components or some I guess sum over components? Sum over um, X in pi zero of G. That's the isomorphism classes of objects in the group voice. Um, uh, one over the other. Uh, well, I was going to say one over the size of uh, pi one of x. I think it writes pi 1 of g with x to the space point. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. yeah. Second argument for space point. There's still floppy notation says that just doesn't look like a space point over here. These are things in space point. Um, this word not the one. This word not the one. <laughs> <laughs> Is it so weird in some ways that it makes you want to write some of this sigma? Uh, I, <laughs> have you ever talked about this before? I have this fear of uh, font. <laughs> so, um, so, um, So did you write this, write this grade last time? Nope. You did it as the uh, for that. Yeah. Or it is a different way. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and then there is something slightly suggestive in a good way about writing it this way, which is you can tell that pi zero is involved in a certain way, pi one is involved in a certain way. Sometimes pi zero is sort of in the top, pi one is in the bottom. Uh, and so this is an interesting deep group fortification process. I think John gave some propaganda for why it's interesting. Sorry. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a decategorification process. And John gave some propaganda for why it's an interesting uh, decategorification process. And I think I'm mostly just going to, you know, let him give the back propaganda for that. Um, but, but we should practice some examples of this. I guess we already did some examples, but we should be introducing some more examples. For example, I think we sort of left off the home exercise last time, which was uh, G equal to the employee of finite sets. That means that means finite set with such a finite set? Any sense of it? <laughs> well, I hadn't been right. Um, maybe I was, <laughs> well, all right. Yeah, okay. Just for, just for now, I'm very about it. This is finite sets. And by injection, sets of morphisms. And the homework exercise was what is the, what is the group-wide cardinality of this? Something like that. Um, so I guess that was when we were insisting that this was finite sets. What is actually arbitrary sets? Won't well, give the answer. <laughs> why? Yeah. Why? Is it, is it really officially like the set officially the same point or? Or do you think you go? I don't really. So the problem is right to the infinite automorphism groups, so one over infinity, oh maybe that's zero. Because it's many. When you add a zero in the number of times, does it really matter? So you're asking does the harmonic series matter? I don't I don't know. I did 
Yeah. Well, uh, for me, it's pain ones, I think, have finite. Um, yeah. Okay, but, but, but these almost qualify. Yeah, yeah. you can yeah. put them in the. This is an example of how you get tempted to keep it extended to the definition. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, this thing keeps telling us something philosophically. I mean, it's kind of like it's telling us that somehow that everything is completely worthless. E plus epsilon. E plus the infinite test. Say that again? The answer when it's infinite test, you get E plus some infinite test. Yeah, but I'm just telling you that philosophically, he keeps saying somehow that infinite tests are not important. Are infinite tests important? Are infinite tests important? So, I don't know, are there any other good examples of this? Do you have any exercises that would be not too long exercises that we give of uh, your new ones to be? Um, um, I guess we don't do a good like example of our two mile trial that we go too far. Oh, this is sort of a pathetic. Example, yeah, but maybe probably you crack it open. So you could think about putting some extra structure on your finite set, and you your way of those preserving that extra structure. And for a really easy example, you could do like a group way of set sequences of two covering. Okay, okay, so did everybody understand that? That example. Yeah. So, uh, so John's next example is two colored finite set and color preserving by Gaussian. sum over how many black dots you have and how many red dots you have. Does that mean we're adding two here or multiplying? It's the sum of sum. It's like but sum. then you're adding those. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. You don't think that's what I'm getting there? So you said the sum over N and M, Where? one over N factorial yeah. and one over N factorial, which is really complicated with this. I guess I'll, I'll give another homework exercise, but I won't try and force you to do it right now. So what, what's that other one? Something like um, trees? So, no, two-stage trees? Um, so, so are those partition sets that are called? Uh, with possibly empty partitions. So in other words, you're saying, uh,
So this, uh, that John was explaining last time, is that it's a decategorification process, which means that there's an accompanying categorification process. So the accompanying categorification process is you go around and you find things like this, things that live here, and you just try to find some interesting way to turn them into group words. So for example, you could start out with the number B and then think, think up this group boy. I don't know if that's how this group boy was invented. <laughs> Probably not at first. <laughs> um, but I guess you can start with some other interesting thing over here, like pi or something like that. And try to make a good group boy put over here. I don't know. I don't know if anybody comes with a really fun answer for that one. No, that's an open okay. problem. Okay. What? Finding a good group boy cardinality is five. Or oh, five. <laughs> so, um, that's good. It's interesting. Yeah, so this is a decategorification process with an accompanying categorification process, which is still defined, in comparison to this, it's well defined. Um, but this is not yet the decategorification process that I was trying to explain. So the decategorification process that I was trying to explain uh, is another process that um, involves sort of a piggybacking, in some sense, of this process. And in fact, in my last lecture, I actually gave something that came pretty close to a formal definition of what piggybacking means in this context. Um, but, but, but the kind of piggybacking that's going on here is, does not quite fit that formal definition. So I don't really know exactly how to formalize what I mean by piggybacking in this case. Well, I mean something by it, and maybe we'll try to figure out what I mean by it, but we probably won't try to formalize it. Um, so, so, okay, so what do I mean? This, what do I mean when I say we're going to take this, we're going to take this process, and we're going to piggyback it. So, over here, See, over here, the group boys are sort of the ground level phenomena. You could call them the objects of this thing over here. So things like, I don't know, the category of pain group or something like that. Or maybe the higher dimensional category, but that's, that's irrelevant. Still, too, but the ground level things here are the group boys. Where now we're going to sort of piggyback this process. We're going to sort of use it in a situation where these things are no longer. I said that wrong. We're going to use it in a situation. We're, we're going to use yeah. We're going to use this. We're going to use this process in a situation. We're going to apply it in a situation where these things over here are sort of like living in the morphisms instead of in the objects. So, like this one I want to say is something like this. We have, blue boys and same fan. And then perhaps we have things between that and center, but I'm not going to focus on that. The same span. Well, okay. Uh, I, that's, that's my next question to answer. I have to make one more comment. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to make this situation over here build on top of this situation over here. Now, when you look at what's going on over here, you might think, aha, we're talking about group boys. So that can make me think of these group boys over here. But that's not what I'm doing here. I, I, I'm emphasizing pain span over here because I want you to associate these pain span over here with these pain group boys 
over here. That's what we're going to be doing. So we're going to be using this coupons cardinality process, but we're not going to be applying it to the coupons that live up here as the object. We're going to be applying it, we're applying the coupons cardinality process to these things here, which are called tame spans. So what are tame spans? Okay. The tame spans, first of all, you have the groupoids G and the groupoid H. And then you have a span of the groupoids. Which means you have an apex groupoid and some functors. That's called a span of the groupoids. That's called the span of the groupoids. And, and I'm talking about tame spans. So I have to figure out what a tame span is. And I never thought about it before, I just made it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. Well, you can do the little span yeah. itself in the group way. It is? Well, the span, the, the span set itself right. is a group way. So do we, do we want to start out with the, with the same? Make sure that at least that one group was the same? Yeah, yeah. We certainly want that. Yeah. And I don't think that's enough. I think um, so we really say we should make this be tame and this be tame. So and should, this be tame. So we really should think of tame group with the same spam? Yeah, we probably should do that to be safe. To be safe. Right. Um, but nevertheless, I'm not going to write tame here. I'll write some very small letters. Because I want to, oh, okay, yeah, I want, I want white to be <laughs> That's the good. The stuff that we're doing over here, uh, stuff that we're doing over here, is going to be working down at this level. So, so in some sense, we're going to be applying, yeah, we're going to be applying this process. We're going to apply it not to these things down here. And in fact, we're not even really going to be applying it to the things up here. Are we kind of the big Are we kind of applying it to well, we have this we have this matrix that was constructed out of this span? Is that yeah. what we want to apply? It to? Yeah, it's something like that. We want to apply it to the fibers. So you can think of this, there's an alternative way to draw a span, which is less conductive because it looks less like a bridge. But you can just draw it like this. Right? So a functor. Sorry, a pair of functors like this is really morally the same thing as a functor to the protein product. And then when you have this thing here, you can consider the fibers Yeah, okay, right. So what, 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 what does a fiber mean? It, means, it probably means you take an object down here and you take the fiber over it. So, yeah, I, but, I, but what I really need is we take a component down here and we take the pre image of that component. So you're taking. Yeah. Is the product of two groupoids another groupoid? Yeah. Yeah. Because so you get no show. So I take the product of two groupoids. So, okay, let's say. So, can you tell me what tame means before you go? Say it again, what what means tame? In the general, what does tame mean for you? Tame in general just means, but, you know, it's nice and easy to deal with. And what's making, so, so John's definition of tame was that this sum converges in a very official way. Um, which then, if you think about what that means, I guess John claims that what that means is that you have a finite number of isomorphic plasmas. No, 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 the finite set is. Okay. So what about if you have each each countable number of isomorphic plasmas? Yeah. And they uh, each and one has a finite each number one has of automorphic. Finite number of automorphisms, and that sum converges. Okay. So the sum is well. You want the terms of the sum to be well defined. And you want the sum itself. You want the sum to converge. Yeah. So that's the definition of a tame groupoid. Uh, so certainly something that would qualify the tame span would be if all of these 
glucolysis have that pain this property. But there's probably some generalization where you don't require a DNA to be pain, and you'd have to find what you should span to be pain, but I didn't work out the details of that. Okay. Um, yeah. But what did you get? It has to do with getting certain sums to convert. Yeah, so the way these things go is you like see what he's going to do with this thing. And you get some stuff that might or might not converge, and then you make up a definition of the entertainment. And this is an over, maybe overkill thing. Everything in sight is the same, but that's it's fine. And, and many, many people can, of course, consider this kind of way of doing things in bad taste, where you make up your definition just going along. But you have to remember this is the way it actually is. Well, it still is, but yeah. nobody will pretend it. Huh? But nobody, right. nobody writes it that way. Because <laughs> when you, eventually when you write it, you now have your definition well defined. You've got to write it down and explain it to somebody else, I guess. Uh, right. right there is where it appears to be. That tape to just go to the long. Right. Okay, so. So, um. I, I guess I, I, yeah, I guess I, I should go ahead and try and define how this process is going to work. So, we're going to go from uh, group voice and pain span. Well, maybe I'll admit that I'm just saying pain group voice and pain span. And we're going to go to, no, actually, actually, uh, let's see, is that going to work? This should be, well, I'll leave it at that for now, but, uh, oh, okay, we'll, we'll have to see if that's good enough and if there's some um, better generalization. So uh, this is going to go to complex vector space, and linear operator. There might be some alternative for you can use instead of complex vector space in there. I guess the same kind of issue is to what kind of numbers you use over here. Um, Certainly, yeah, certainly all mean numbers qualify as complex numbers. So we're, we're, that's why it's good enough to say complex numbers over here. So, um, so we have to, we have to, or, and I think John already did, but we're, we're just going over here. We have to define this process of D group order space. And and um, and, and yeah, and in some sense, in some sense, the process of deep coordination is going to be this process of group board cardinality, but down at this level. Not up at this level, down at this level, where we're using the process that we've worked right now. So, so let's try to write some definition or formula of what's going on here. So we have group YG. And now we take it to the zeroth homology of G, which you can think of as the you can think of it as a free vector space. Is that the right symbol for yeah, you vector space? Okay. Okay. On the set of isomorphism classes. Objects. What, what does G stand for now? I still G is a group boy. G is one of these same group boys that is up here.
you know, to, to really guarantee this, that this is going to work, I would, I would really, uh, to, to guarantee that this is going to work, I, I think I'm going to insist that we use that these ultra tame group boys and ultra tame bands. I think it's fine. So, you know, everything is banned, everything is important, everything is banned, it's fine. Well, then we don't even need, we don't even need real numbers at that point. We don't need rational numbers then. That's right, that's right. So you could probably use the rational numbers right here. Um, we want to go beyond that, eventually, but a lot of what we do won't need to go beyond that. So, yeah, so this is the, the free vector space using whatever focus we're using over, on, sorry, on the set of isomorphic classes of chaos. So again, just emphasizing that we're not applying new boy card down here. We're doing something different. Yes, when we say everything, we mean the G and the H and the S. Just a little strange because there's, actually, there's this symmetry built into. It's, yeah, it's a span. It's that we say that as the span of G and H, but it's also could be thought of the span of G by symmetry. So, so shouldn't we be able to take this process, taking it that both ways, and get a invertible? No, because because to turn a linear operator around, you're not stuck with only being able to use the inverse. There are other processes for turning linear operators around, making them go the other way, so, like taking adjoints of some kind. I mean, you might need a little extra structure in order to take the adjoint of a linear operator, but we actually have, it turns out, that extra structure lurking around here. And um, so, so that's what you're talking about. Of, instead of thinking of this as a span going from G to H, you can just look at it the other way, span going from H to G, 
that's going to correspond to like taking the, the adjoint of a matrix or the adjoint of a linear algebra. Okay. So, and it's not just the dance force, it's the real of the again? We are working over the complex one, so it's not the dance force. That dance force conjugate. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah. Well, that's what you mean by the but all the matrices we're getting are never going to have complex entries into it, right? So the, the well, we didn't even say how we're doing it. But the true point of carbon analysis is always a real number, so far. So complex yeah. navigation doesn't really show up. I'm sorry, I missed that. What was the question? Was the he was wondering whether you wanted to make conjugate transposes of the matrices. But it was the same adjunct as we know for complex. And I was saying, well, yeah, but it doesn't really matter because right, we can't really, yeah. really get any matrices of complex numbers yeah. out of this process. So yeah. real but that means you have the freedom to decide if everything's the best. Because <laughs> you can't tell the um, So I'm defining this map here as this composite. So I'll tell you what these maps are. And this is the usual thing that you would use on homology. I guess it's well, first of all, let me give these names here. Um, Okay. And this map down here is like got sometimes called the K sub star. Okay, and you can see induced map on the model. And this map up here is a guess called J upper street. Yes, well, you made a ton of I made <laughs> Uh, and that's the transfer thing. Yeah, so that's transfer. That's the thing I'm trying to explain. And right now, I will give an official definition of what transfer means in this context for our purposes. Because I don't even know whether the usual definition of transfer will even apply in this special case. So uh, I'll just define what J upper shriek is. So it's a map from H0 of G to H0 of S. Here's where I get the formula for it. Okay. So supposing we have uh, X, which is, you know, an isomorphism. I guess the B. Yeah, okay. G is the codomain. I guess I'm going to call this Y. Y is an isomorphism class uh, of G. In other words, it's a basic element for this thing over here. Right? This is the, by definition a free vector space on these basic elements. So I'm sending the basic element somewhere, and that's a good way to define linear operators. And I send it to the sum over x, which is an ISO class of S over Y. And I send it to
attend to that formula. Over here? Yeah. So I'm 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 indicating, or perhaps I'm already speaking. Yep. This is. Uh, well, you got a. You got a. <laughs> well, how does this isomorphism class turn into a group word? That's what you want. Well, okay. So first of all, when we talk about group over here, what we're really talking about is that means by none of us one. You can think of these as equivalent classes of group boys. And these are so you think you can think of these isomorphism classes, you can think of them as little subgroup boys, little connected subgroup boys. A component might be a name. Yeah. A component. Maybe I said a component or something like that. I don't know. And um, yeah, so that's how that makes sense. And the usage of this symbol here, this again, this means this absolute value sign or norm sign or whatever it is, uh, means groupoid cardinality. We, 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 we've already established that. And of course, one of the advantages of establishing that is that if we ever change our mind about what process we want to use, we can still we can reuse this same formula if we ever change our mind about uh, what the group wide cardinality can do. Um, I'm not sure we're ever going to see that, but I guess I'm just raising that as a possibility that we might. I don't know whether it would be consistent to use other possibilities for this formula over here, uh, but I do know that it is consistent to use this definition that we're giving here, where the uh, where this symbol is defined to be the group white cardinality as we've been using it. Now, um, so there are some things about this formula that are sort of sort of obvious, or obvious after you stare at them for a while. One yeah. thing is that so far we figured out the right hand side is a number, but if you really want to get an element of H0. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's wrong. It's, it's supposed to be. Am I right? That's the way I remember writing it. That's better. I think this makes sense. I think this, the one I previously wrote didn't make sense. This one does make sense. Sorry. Certainly has. Yeah. What part of the most of the changing and that just in terms of the vectors to be. The linear combination of the linear combination. Right. Yeah, we're just taking a coefficient in front of this space. So uh, the common argument we can make is that let's see. If you think about the case where J is the identity counter, then that I think helps you to remember like why there's this denominator. Um, because it would be a very sensible thing to do to have the identity function, the identity functor J go to the identity operator uh, between the homologies. And having this division by the group wide cardinality of Y is helpful in sort of canceling out what's going on here. So oh, but then you have this because you have that. Right, you just begging the, the question as to why you that inserted that coefficient yeah. up there. <laughs> um, okay, okay, okay. But if you do, this is going to somehow you figure out. Because here, it seems to be sort of G group where you can say for each isoplast Y, and you get all elements that are isomorphic to something over Y. Then you're counting them in, with that. It seems that you're counting x with some other Yeah. That might well actually work right. the rather yeah. 
Why it must look like some union of components? Yes. That's right. Oh, so that, is that, that's I think that's what I'm missing. Right? That's, yeah. And I think I remember John talking about that. In fact, there's sort of picture that goes along with that. And the picture, yeah. So, so we actually did, if we did it ourselves, I think they should use uh, that kind of It's really good to this picture. So the picture that we have of Over G. Yeah, uh, right. We have. Well, but, but I, I want to sort of both so G and H. Okay, that's an F, G, H. Everything that's going on over here is just about the, the part between S. And T. Um, but nevertheless, the picture is sort of helpful, I think, to draw also what's going on with H. So, Each one of these separate pieces could itself be a bunch of pieces, or maybe no pieces. 
but it has to split up like this. And in particular, in particular, it splits up when you're looking at it this way. When you're looking at it this way, it splits up into these three pieces. One first piece, second piece, third piece. The third piece lies over the third piece here. Second piece lies over the second component. Okay. And, and each component to isomorphism class of S lies completely in one of those squares. That's right. right. And when we commented last time, there's just no way that something can like come across. And there can't be any real interaction between the stuff that lives here and the stuff that lives here or the stuff that lives here. Because, you know, if you have a morphism going from object here to a morphism, a morphism from object here to an object here, it would have, well, okay, yeah, okay. that would have to give us the morphism going from object here to an object here. But, but we're assuming there aren't any. So you have to get this matrix. And, okay, so how does this compare to the definition that you get? It's in the equivalent as well. I think I see that. I So don't worry about it yet. I don't. I didn't write anything like that big normalizing factor y down there in the bottom. And okay. Well, why don't you go ahead and then I'll figure out. What okay. 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 I'm pretty sure this is the correct way to it. And I didn't catch. Now that it was a mistake last time, but I didn't. I forget how far I exactly got. Okay. I got to this point. I was trying to calculate. A matrix of numbers, and that led me to group by starting off. And then you can stop the group by trying to. Okay, you so that's the matrix. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. Right. So maybe that we just didn't get this stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't have time to pick that. So, say what? I just have a. But you're saying you can figure out that it needs to be that normalizing factor y. Get the identity to go to the other channel. Is that it? No. Oh, right. Okay. And repeat that comment I said that. Yeah. Okay. This, yeah. So that's how it's supposed to work. And I'm claiming that it does work. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to be obligated to prove right now that it does. Yes, go ahead. But you can answer our proof. Oh, we What does work mean? What does work mean? Um, I guess the main thing that work means here is you want to prove that this process as we defined it has all the usual formal properties that transfer in homology has. So people talk about this process of transfer for, for certain homology theories. And um, they have to have certain properties. Well, one property is that you can state without even knowing any of that stuff. Yeah. Is that this decouplification should send composites of spans yeah, so that is, again, that's, that's sort of really sort of a, a big part of the secret motivation behind the concept of transfer. That it lets you do that. It lets you, it, it lets you have span and do things nicely on the homology. Um, so, Yeah, so I think the main things I want to do now is try to give some examples, including the relevant examples for the original application that caused me to want to talk about this in the first place, which is try to say the correct version of a certain theorem. Um, so let me try to give some examples. Um, I guess I want to try to give examples where you can try to you can try to carry out this process. 
uh, we can try to carry out this process to what we can. So, so let, me, let me try to think of let's try to think of the most relevant example. I guess I should try to, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out which is the example I want. I guess to help myself figure it out, I should try to really think about what I want over here. What I want to do, uh, <laughs> something that I'm giving you the end. So, yeah. So, what I want to get over here is I want to get. get something like um, um, from uh, what, what kind of notation is for the hum um, between certain permutation representations of a finite group? So I'll say Are you gonna, gonna get this? Yeah. 
See, the point is we took, we took the zero homology of an object, but we didn't play the trick yet of getting a span to give something between the zero homologies of different objects. That's what we're trying to do now. So let me show you give an example here. See, so for example, there's a very useful map that goes like this. It goes from And the point is that specifying the composition map between these Tom spaces is part of building the category. Uh, in particular, this category of permutation representations. So, in other words, you want to produce this map, which is one of the maps that you have to produce when you're building the permutation representation category. So, in other words, we're using it. If we succeed, we're, then we're using this degree fortification process to build the desired category, the category of permutation representation. And you need the spans to do this? Yes, I'm going to give you a span that, that induces this map. Well, there is, there is a slightly trick, 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 tricky part, in the fact that we've got a tensor product up there. But, but hopefully that won't cause too much of a problem. Yeah, 
that's a big question, 25 million. <laughs> and I guess I could ask people whether there are any objections for what you put in that. I'll just say stuff. So, so X times Y, weekly mod G. Is a thing whose objects are orbits of x times y, which we are sometimes calling atomic invariant relations or string things, figures of type x, figures of type y. So it's sort of like an object of the upper left hand thing, a relation between guys and x and guys and y. And we have relations between guys and y, and guys and z, relations between guys and x and guys and z. That's the part of the part of the part of the part of the It's got to be something that's big and juicy enough so that it has maps down to all of those. It's something like a sink. So you're, you're, you're just trying to I'm trying encourage to, people to make guesses. I'm trying to encourage people to make guesses by thinking. Remember how the whole question was that composition of operators didn't quite get along with composition of relations. We're still, we're finally answering that question. And that the object in each of those will be put there, it's a relation. And so we're trying to do something like compose those relations. But it's kind of a little bit different now. So Now, what I'm drawing now is a slightly modified version of the diagram that I just wrote a moment ago. And this version I'm drawing now, it either, depending on how you look at it, it either addresses a forward question or it doesn't. Um, but it relates to a forward question. Uh, right? You sort of a map into a Cartesian product. You can think of it as two separate maps. And there's something suggestive about drawing it this way. It makes it look very, I don't know, try, uh, try whatever. Try angular. Try angular. Um. Should certainly. Say it again. What did you say? What did you say? And on the next one, after you draw this, of course, you would think of x cross y cross z more z. Yeah, I think that that's correct. Oh. Have you actually said that that's a diagram actually? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a triality or something. Uh, yeah, that was good. 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 Uh, so, yeah, okay, we're running out of time, and we actually got a quick answer from the audience. Of course, I have to think about how this works. Maybe we can get John to explain more about how it works. But the moral is supposed to be that this, believe it or not, actually answers, when you follow this up, this answers the question that. Yeah, but we, we need more, more time to explain how to answer the question. But this does answer the question of how to formulate the correct theorem that we're trying to get one place. In other words, this gives you a correct way of building the category of permutation representation by a deep equation process. Of course, it's a little bit funny calling it a way of constructing things since it's a deep equation process. I guess it's more like a way of demolishing something and obtaining as the rubble uh, the category of permutation representation. Um, but yeah, but I'm claiming that this actually, when we work it out, fixes the theorem for us. We had a theorem that we had fixed. This is the way it fixed it. Of course, we'll need to explain better at some point how this fixes it. Um, but that is more or less where we're stopping today. I think I might have another comment though, which is, 